You're listening to NIL Now, a podcast dedicated to the name, image, and likeness of today's college and high school athletes. So we're going to explore the crazy and wildly interesting world of name, image, and likeness. NIL Now, covering the latest sports business headlines and keeping you informed on the nation's top performers. This is NIL Now, where the stars of tomorrow are getting noticed today. It's the Wild Wild West, but we're wrangling it in. Presented by Headline Studio. And read it. Here are your hosts, Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. Hello, friends, and welcome back to another episode of NIL Now, a production of Headline Studio and Reddit. We are out wherever you listen to your podcast, so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss a thing. So we have some important news to get to, but first and foremost, my buddy KJ is setting sail to vast lands, traveling overseas this week, so he will not be with us, but instead... My buddy, our producer, Dean Zolkowski, will be the co-host for today's show and excited to uh, jump into some of these headlines because let's be real, Dean, you know, the SEC spring meetings always raise some eyebrows, some headlines, some thoughts from just around the league and obviously the coaches and you know you're always going to get some good juicy material to talk about after the spring meetings. First and foremost, how are you doing today, my friend? I'm doing great. And uh, yes, you you do bring up an interesting point here. And as I'm looking at this uh, first talking point, as I put it on the outline, um, it was almost catered to Kevin. And I will have to uh, do my due diligence to represent Kevin today. But (laughs) you know, as as we talk about it, and as you'll kind of lean into it here in a bit, Kevin, as we know, is is the nickname master. As is the you know, he's coming up with all the nicknames for, you know, whoever's creating news in the NIL space. And uh, I do not have any good ones, but but as I'm putting this outline together, I'm like, man, Kevin is going to have a field day with, uh, you know, what we're about to talk about. Uh, we might we might have to text him when he uh, when he gets off his plane and be like, hey, we need you to tweet at us some uh, some good headlines here, some good nicknames that can go along with this, because, yes, he is the king of the nicknames and literally off the cuff. It, it, it always amazes me. NIL headlines. Uh, but we do miss KJ today, but we hope he's enjoying his travels. And, of course, we'll have Bob back on the show here in a bit to weigh in on some of these same topics. But off the top, uh, SEC spring meetings to me are always pretty interesting. Uh, you know, while sometimes it's like, oh, it's sort of pedestrian, it's sort of like the same thing every year. But really, it's when the coaches have the opportunity to kind of go behind closed doors, have conversations, bring up talking points, bring up things that are of concern, things that work, things that don't work. And it's really when you get all the coaches in the same room and trying to get them all on the same page, right? And so in this case, um, we'll specifically talk about Missouri uh, head football coach Eli Drinkwitz, which he has been known to be at the forefront of NIL discussion and player advocacy for some time, really since NIL kind of obviously its inception and even prior to that. And he believes he was taken out of context when speaking recently at the SEC spring meeting specifically about this. Drinkwitz said earlier in the week that SEC spring meetings that college players are making more on NIL than his brother-in-law, a pediatrician who, quote, saves lives. He then later joined this Paul Feinbaum show to clarify his point. Here's an interesting clip of some of what he said. What I want everybody to understand is that there's unintended consequences with giving 18 to 22-year-olds a large sum of money. And I think that's what there needs to be an understanding of, is we're not talking about players making ten or twelve thousand dollars a year we're talking about guys that are making six figures seven figures which is awesome but with that much money comes a different set of responsibilities and if we're not careful we're going to look back in four and five years and we're going to be just like the nfl and the nba where 78 percent of those professional athletes after five years removed from playing in the nfl or nba are bankrupt so listening to this dean there's kind of the counter argument uh he he's been an advocate for nil has been known to talk openly about it and to provide support in this space. And then here, you know, I kind of get this gist and and sort of what he's saying. And I, I mean, he's not wrong because a lot of these kids are making significant figures and you can't say whether it's worth it, not worth it, you know, not, not necessarily going to dig into that specifically. But, you know, I think his whole point when he went on the Paul Feinbaum show was kind of to say, hey, we get these large sums of money. 
you're talking about kids that are kids. They're 18 to 22 years old. You have to make decisions in life. You have to have life experiences. And let's be real. If any one of us, how old are you, Dean? I'm 24. Oh my gosh. So you're only two years removed from this range, this age range. I'm 38. So we'll just put that into context. But look, I mean, if you're a 22-year-old, 18 to 22-year-old, even a 24-year-old, and you're handed a large sum of money, 100000 200000 500000 a million dollars, you know, that is life-changing like snap overnight. And, you know, because as a college student, you know, most kids are obviously, um, you know, given support, you know, in maybe some way, shape, or form, whether it's from family members. Uh, you know, I know me personally, like my parents when I was in college would deposit $50 here and there into my bank account. But like, you know, I never saw much more than that in one given, you know, time. And then all of a sudden it's like, if you saw this kind of money just sink into your bank account, there is responsibility that goes with it. And I think KJ, obviously not being here, I speak for him because he's talked about it too, whereas there is that financial piece that is so very important. And when you're 18 to 22 years old, because me over here goes into the science and the medical aspect, our brains aren't even fully developed till we're 25. And we're using lived experience, life experiences, but you don't know what you don't know. And you always can look back and be like, dang, I wish I would have known this. I would have maybe saved my money or whatever. And so I think that the responsibility piece is kind of what he's pointing to as he sort of digs deeper into the context of what he was saying. You don't know what you don't know. True words have never been spoken. But one thing that, that this makes me think about, and maybe you can agree with you know, some of the guests that we've had on the show, you know, he brings up a good point that, yeah, you know, especially the NFL, the, the not for long league, there are a lot of, you know, it's, it's not a long career there. So, you know, you kind of have to make your money there and, you know, who knows how long you're going to be in the league. But I, I think that NIL can be used as a way for, you know, these people to either save money or learn valuable skills to market themselves or, or how to handle their money. So, you know, maybe instead of, you know, NIL is going to hurt them and, and they're going to be bankrupt after, um, you know, the five season, four seasons, whatever they play, you know, in the NFL, this this could be a good thing, you know. And I, and I think that a lot of the student athletes who have come on the show have actually said that this is they're learning valuable skills right now through NIL that they wouldn't have learned um, had they not signed these deals. So I, it can definitely be looked at both ways. Um, and that's a lot of people do look at it the way that, you know, he kind of expressed. But I, I think you also kind of have to look at it as a good thing that, you know, student athletes, again, and, and you know, he kind of pointed to the, the kids making, you know, six figures or, or you know, $100,000 deals. And as we know, that's most of the kids are not making that much money. Most of them are, are making the ten to 12000 that he mentioned. So you have to look at it both ways. And he has, so it was a little surprising to see, um, you know, him kind of talk about it just this one way, if you will. Yeah, and I think, again, this is probably him starting to dabble in the mindset of, like, we talk about the Wild Wild West, wrangling things in, putting guardrails up. I mean, I do think that there comes a point where their guardrails do have to be put up. Put up. And, and, again, a lot of it, too, is – it becoming an even playing field and there's, you know, as we'll get into more discussion about legislation and, you know, what's right and what's wrong and how it's sort of not going well in that department as far as providing that even playing field amongst the states and, uh, you know, all the, the, the legalities of things. Uh, but you know, I think to kind of close out this talking point, you know, because there is this perception that all these kids are making millions of dollars. But even if you're talking about a small percentage, I will I will agree with you. You know, I think most of our guests that we've had, you know, I think we've had a range that probably some that make more, some that's more, maybe more product based, some, um, you know, on the lower end of the scale. But it does seem like overall they're taking it and using it in a positive way. And, you know, look, you you can only instill that so much in somebody. Right. So if you're you're the coach of a team or let's just say an ad, uh, an, uh, an admin of a team that is um, helping implement financial uh, classes and, you know, empowering these kids to learn more, right? Like you can teach them as much as you want, but at the end of the day, they still have to ultimately go make the decision, right? You can't make the decision for them. So I think really what it comes down to is education, empowering them to try to make good choices. And then, you know, it's going to be a lot of live and learn and, and, and kind of go from there. And you just hope that you've equipped them to make the right choices, 
you're going to win some and lose some. You're not always going to have everybody on the same page. And you might have people that come back 10 years later and say, man, I'm so glad I had this financial class. I'm so glad I had this coach, this mentor, because they really helped me make the right decisions. And then you're going to have people that come back and say, man, I wish I would have known, or I wish I would have done a better job with this because we all have regrets in life. And I think that's just part of living, learning and um, experiencing what you don't know, right? So jumping to our next topic, talking about a top high school recruit and his NIL promises. So this is kind of interesting. So the NIL summit took place this week for the on three NIL elite series. And, you know, between the SEC meetings and obviously this summit, a lot of topics have come to fruition. You know, we're kind of in the, you know, this we're entering into this summer period, this dead period where you're not going to have a lot of headlines, but a lot of these meetings are inciting conversation. And one of those topics of conversation came up with uh, KJ Bolden, a safety from Buford, Georgia, eight overall prospect in 2024 recruiting class, according to 24-7 sports composite rankings. And at the On3 NIL Elite Series, Bolden spoke specifically about NIL and kind of what's been happening behind closed doors with coaches in the recruiting trail. And so he specifically said, if a school is telling you that you're going to get millions or in the millions range, that's quarterback money. Then receivers and safeties, well, we're like in the 700 to 600-ish range, which let's be real, that's nothing to, uh, you know, just glance over. And then he said, schools always tell me in those ranges there, I had a school tell me, we're going to get you $2 million during the first year. Come on. Some schools you know are lying. Some schools you know who's for real. Bolden at this point has about 40 offers. Obviously, big schools, Alabama, Georgia, Clemson, Ohio State, Notre Dame amongst a few. It is interesting to get some more insight into the conversations that are being had. And I'm always curious to know how these students vet these statements and or these promises out to determine if they're factual, if it's just blowing smoke, is it smoke and mirrors? Um, I think there's probably a lot that goes into it. Yeah. And I know what I just said about Elijah Drinkwitz's comments and, and how uh, maybe it, it almost seems like we don't know what's going on behind closed doors. But if if this truly is what it is, and granted, you know, Bolden is, is a top recruit. So he's probably making it when they're throwing around numbers like that, he's probably seeing the highest numbers um, of, of those high school recruits. But yeah, that's that's serious money. And, and you know, to to think that these kids are probably having conversations with one another about, oh, you know, this school is offering me X number of money. And, you know, so and so told me that they'll give me two million. And, and you know, the fact that these kids are almost, you know, thinking that, oh, this school could be lying to me. This school is probably telling me the truth. This school I don't know about. You know, it makes you wonder what the future will look like. And will these kids be trusting these schools? You know, what will the relationship between a school and a, and a student athlete look like in a few years, because I don't know. I, I have no idea. And, and when you look at these numbers being thrown around for high school kids who some of whom are saying, you know, I'm not even worth that much money. I'm worth more. It's pretty wild. And, and, you know, we throw that term around a lot, but that to me, and you could probably argue and people have argued that this has been going on under the table for so long, but to hear the kids actually come out and talk about it, you know, as as uncommitted recruits saying, you know, this school only offered me, you know, five hundred thousand dollars, and you know, I'm I'm worth more than that. You know, it, it's it's honestly good that they have that power and and all power to them, but it's still, it still hasn't totally gotten easier to to hear high school kids talk about it that way. Um, well, let me let me just put this into perspective. First of all, knowing your self worth can be very difficult, and I'm just going to go ahead and put it out there for everyone to hear. It is something I struggle with mentally and internally, what my value is, what my self-worth is. I literally have conversations with my therapist, yes, my therapist that I see on a weekly or biweekly basis, talking about my value because I think it's something that personally I struggle with and sometimes knowing, okay, what am I worth? And, you know, if I'm going to go do a uh, speaking engagement and you know, uh, give some words of encouragement and wisdom. It's sometimes hard for me to put a value on that. Like in my mind, I'm just like, you know, I'm going to go do this thing and I'm going to help, help people. But like, who truly wants to hear Lauren Sisler speak? Like, you know, um, so there's always that like angel and devil on the shoulder, you know, one thing saying, oh, go for it, go help some people. And then the other, the other thing saying, no, like you're not worth it, you know? And, and I think that's just obviously, um, you know, something internally I battle. So with that being said, as it plays into this context, 
I don't know where people are getting these metrics, where they're getting this value, because like, I would be terrified to walk up in a room and tell whatever coach, hey, I'm worth this much. Uh, I will come to your school, but you got to give me this much. Like, how do you even come up with that number? And I would just be terrified. I would not have the guts and or courage probably to approach it that way, which is also why I guess you hire an agent and have them approach it that way and let them play, you know, good, good cop, bad cop. But when you're talking about this kind of money, it's hard to get used to seeing the power that they have right now. And, you know, I'd be curious if you take a roster of, you know, 85 guys, I'd be curious to know how many of those guys on that roster have the courage to kind of step up and say, this is what I'm worth. I'm going to come to your school if dot, dot, dot. How many of them are actually doing it or how many of them are actually just showing up as they would back five, 10 years ago, you know, get recruited and then find their value once they've already arrived on campus and started kind of down that road. NIL Now with Lauren Sisler and Kevin Jones. If you want to learn more about name, image, and likeness, you need to go to The Source, the NIL Now podcast from Headline Studio and Reddit highlights the The biggest biggest storylines. NIL is not a cherry on top. It needs to be a part of these young men and women's future to, you know, further their careers. You should be able to leave college with something. Subscribe to NIL Now on Apple, Spotify, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. All right, and that segues us perfectly into Mr. Babak Hayeri. We got a lot to dig into here. Uh, We talked about the spring meetings. We talked about Eli Drinkwitz, his comments um, at the top of the show, just about, uh, you know, kind of talking about how this compares to, uh, you know, a lot of these kids are making more money than his brother-in-law, who was a pediatrician saving lives. And then he kind of had to rescind or at least put some context with that because he has been known to be an advocate for these players. And so he's an advocate for NIL. Uh, and then you have Commissioner Sankey jumping in, just talking about this being a, f- uh, a runaway freight train at the state level. So I'll let you kind of take it from here um, to kind of dig a little deeper on sort of these statements, comments, and what we're hearing about behind closed doors as these meetings commence amongst the co- coaches and the, um, you know, the, the leagues as they're trying to figure out, you know, what the future might hold in the NIL space. Yeah, definitely. You know, Commissioner Sankey, he's kind of in a bind, too, because with all the new laws that are coming out with places like Missouri and uh, which, again, such a good player friendly uh, law doesn't really get pushed through in Missouri unless Drinkwitz was on the same page. So, yeah, I, I think he just got taken out of context. But, you know, and with what's going on in Oklahoma and Texas, and we'll probably see another wave of those kinds of laws coming soon. Everyone's focusing on the fact that these laws say the NCAA can't enforce things in the states that are passing them. But they also pretty much make it clear the SEC also can't enforce the uh, the laws. I mean, the, the athletic departments. Yeah, you know, probably the athletic SEC. If the real SEC wanted to get involved, you you best believe they're going to get in there. In fact, I think everyone's kind of quietly rooting for SEC versus the SEC, and we're really going to see which one matters more. Um, I was about to say, will the real SEC please stand up? Yes. <laughs> in the words of Eminem. <laughs> oh my goodness! Yes, I mean. He, and, and, Anyway, so, you know, obviously the jokes aside, you know, using the runaway freight train kind of analogy definitely brought some fans who wanted to point at Purdue being the one behind all of this, you know, choo-choo. I.e. The, the, the person at the top here, the horse joke person, we won't say what he said, but basically bad language word, Purdue, dot, 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 leave it there. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know, and people love their Purdue. It's always fun with the soulless eyes of Purdue Pete looking at all of uh-huh. us, gazing at us from the abyss. But going back to to Sankey, uh, <laughs> you know, I think a lot of this it, it's also and it builds into this whole this whole situation because as much as the NCAA is the one that everyone wants to kind of have a strong feeling at, like they shouldn't have a right to enforce things or they should, and whether or not Congress should be dragged into this, a lot of you know the commissioners like Sankey are like this is also creating a situation for our conference because. He's responsible to all the the teams in the conference. It's going to be 16, as we know very soon. You know, sure, the Texas schools are not going to get some cool rules. So is Oklahoma. So is Mizzou. But as some of the the articles have pointed out, meanwhile, Florida can't do some of the things that they can do in these other states. So he's now a commissioner of a bunch of schools 
many of which are not thrilled with what some of the other states are doing within it. Because you've got 11 states in the SEC across those 16 schools, and all of them are passing different rules. So that therein lies the the complication. You know, there was one of the uh, one of the folks on RCFB, uh, USC fan, uh, Southern Cal, not uh, not not the the Gamecocks, Scourge seventy seven. You know, he's right about it being a runaway freight train, but with the NCAA being blocked by all these new state laws, there's not much they can do to put guardrails on it to prevent the train from going off the tracks or hurting players, programs, and schools. If they do put on guardrails, it's either going to get shot down or ignored. So collective bargaining, label athletes as employees, and certain taxes and laws being applied to the future of college sports, don't be surprised if some government entity is formed to act in the place of the NCAA. And what he sort of don't be surprised is kind of what we're seeing in the background. There's several Congress people trying to pass or at least get some legislation moving and trying to create some sort of federal rule in all of this. It's uh, it's understandable why it's coming that direction because it is such a confusing situation for so many different states. And frankly, you know, Kirby Smart went on the record, I believe, ahead of these SEC conferences, basically saying that that there needs to be kind of a fair system. And and being the the two time reigning national champion, a lot of people just wanted to dogpile him. But I kind of get where a lot of these coaches are coming from. In fact, it kind of goes in parallel with something coaches have been saying about ever since the transfer portal was put into place. They don't get a break anymore. Like, it is 24-7 if you're uh, an FBS head coach. You have to be on everything because you might lose a player to the transfer portal. There might be an NIL deal you need to be aware of. All the assistants have to be constantly on fire, you know, all the time without the breaks they used to have. So there's there's a, a level of also just workload burnout that's coming to all of this. And, and now, throwing on top of that, you've got this patchwork of laws that keep getting passed and keep kind of conflict, potentially conflicting with each other. You've got a real interesting situation there. And, and I think it's you know, this is a really exciting time to be talking about NIL. I, I I, mean, I'm old enough to remember what NIL was like in 2022. So, <laughs> you know, <laughs> what it is now, holy cow, is a totally different ballgame. Well, just going off that with what you're kind of talking about, and I know coaches have spoken about, you know, the calendar and how they really don't get many breaks. I remember Kirby Smart watching him land in a helicopter on a, on a high school field to you know, see a kid that the same month that he had just won back to back, you know, national titles. Um, it, it is pretty ridiculous. And I'm with you, Bob Ack. When I initially saw those comments, it's like Kirby, like everyone's trying to get like you, everyone's trying to get like Georgia right now, you know, for you to be like, this needs to be a, an even playing field. It, it seems a little, you know, it, it rings a little hollow when it's coming from, you know, the, the guy who has, you know, done a lot of winning the last two years, but how are some of these coaches supposed to, you know, recruit in some of the other states where it's it's literally harder for them to recruit kids than it is for the in-state coach? It's something has to change. And, and you know, just hearing from you and reading some of these articles, it's, you know, it's clearly a work in progress. But I don't know how that, that stays. And I don't know how coaches, you know, for the longest time they've had the power someone's going to do something, right? It's it's either going to be Saban or it's going to be Kirby. And, and someone's going to do something if that continues, because there's no way that, you know, that they're going to stand for that. And maybe it's not the biggest deal right now where, you know, the, the, the biggest one that's coming to mind is really Missouri and what has passed there. You know, if if Missouri had all the top prospects in the country and, and they were all going to Mizzou now suddenly, you know, then it would be a bigger deal. I wonder if this is going to become something where it's like, you know, one of the other states passes it Maybe Georgia isn't the best example, but, you know, another state that would benefit another mm-hmm. team rather than Georgia or Alabama um, that really pushes for, you know, someone to step up and, and you know, kind of make an ultimatum or something like that. You know, one thing that kind of I've never really thought about it until we were just talking just now, but what could happen if some basically really passionate fans of one particular program are not thrilled They maybe they live in another state that just passed very like a Mizzou-ish law that that benefits the the actually Missouri would be a good example because a lot of people who are huge KU fans, Kansas fans, live in Kansas City on the Missouri side. So they would have standing to sue the state of Missouri over a law that they feel violates something. And I'm not saying I don't know what I, I'm gonna be very cautious here as an attorney. I don't know what they would sue on, but hey, people have sued for less, right? Would it be interesting to see some of these laws challenged in court? I mean, I, there was a what, in another article we're going to be talking about just on the same topic about all the the potential chaos that's going on here. There was a Texas Tech fan 
who pointed out, like, I'm waiting to see how the Supreme Court of Texas is going to ju- justify if it, if challenged is a presumption. The uh, the NIL legislation they just passed or are about to pass with their favorite mantra that the state shall not interfere with the freedom of contract. Like, literally, that is exactly what these laws are doing. It's like the freedom of contract. No, no, not outside of the state. No, 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 no. And, and hey, if you start messing with contracts across states and favoritism in that sense and inter interstate commerce, then you do pull the federal government into it. And then the U.S. Supreme Court can come in and talk about it. It is interesting, and I don't even know where to begin. I mean, maybe that's a good segue to talk about the next part of this, because Ross Dellinger over at SI wrote a really interesting article kind of going across what's going on in SEC land. Because, you know, in a trend, you know, he sent out a tweet that summarized it, in a trend sweeping through the SEC, schools are exploring ways to operate NIL from their foundations. It violates NCAA rules, risks Title IX infractions, and straddles the employment line. And then kind of goes into all of that. And the real sweet quote, the one quote that isn't really um, attributed, but an SEC, uh, I don't know if it was an athletic director, but someone in an SEC athletic department said, quote, we are all money laundering, which brought a few (laughs) quotes from The Wire among the peanut gallery at RCFB. There's so much going on in that article. And just because it really outlines how much of a mess we're in, the biggest takeaway, I think, in terms of concerns, if I am a university president, because they're kind of like on the side, like watching the athletic departments go bonkers. And they've typically been pretty cool with the athletic departments because, hey, that gets people excited. They might donate to academic programs and people love to be an alumnus of their particular university. But here, what they're starting to get close to are things that could challenge the very nonprofit status of some of the foundations. If they start to blur into this, if you're the kind of Flips that people are doing, the contortions people are doing to sort of say we're paying players and we're a nonprofit. Like, okay, <laughs> you're showing up and like at a Zoom meeting and waving at donors, and maybe there'll be a couple of people from a children's hospital in the background who don't get the comment that, hey, we're this is a this is a charitable organization. Like they're all watching in horror as these things are kind of this brinksmanship. Like, how loose can we play this? And The idea is all, and even the state legislatures are doing this too. It's like, it's, as we've said before, it's a very easy basket. It's bipartisan. People love college sports. You know, you're going to get a bunch of people on both sides of the aisle being like, yeah, let's totally help the local team. And then what, are they going to end up creating a situation that creates not only, I mean, setting aside the NCAA rules, Title IX isn't, you know, that could be a a huge blow up, let alone, you know, are we going to accidentally create a situation where these foundations are so close to the university? The Texas A&M model, the 12th Man Foundation, deciding to kind of try and approach this. And they've been apparently they have not sponsored a player yet, even though they announced this in February, because it seems to be that they're waiting to see if they can and waiting to see what the echoes are before they accidentally create a, a real bigger fiasco. But I mean, if they go through and do this, there are some arguments that could be made and that this starts to really become an employee relationship. You know, we are giving the university is is controlling all of their their live their you know they, they all the work they do is for the university and basically another arm of the university here here you go here's your salary or what is equivalent to it so a lot of these kind of attempts to try and push the limits could break down the very nature of what all of these athletic departments are built on um, and whether or not you want that to happen or not I mean there's a lot of people including on our CFB or just a little bit sad, disgusted that maybe this is becoming just minor league sport. Although it's not like people weren't paid before. On a lighter note, a Mississippi fan, Mississippi State fan said, you know, this all sounds risky. I recommend just sticking to money that a booster embezzled from a children's hospital. I guess no one, everyone in that state cannot resist <laughs> oh. those digs at, at all. Oh my gosh. I, I will say, Bob, Ak, this thread has me cracking up over here. Like, I don't even know where to start because I'm seeing some wildly entertaining comments, especially this stuff about Baton Rouge and uh, Louisiana and money laundering and cashiers. And then this cashier jumps in and said, Hey, I'm a Louisiana cashier. I don't get any of these jokes. And (laughs) one of the simplest jokes is I love that Texas A&M fans are kind of like, wait, why are we the featured image? (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, Texas A&M has been the brunt of it, has seen the brunt of it this last couple of weeks. Even remember last week, our topic of conversation about $10 million to a coach versus $1 million 
NIL or you reverse that. And then what we were saying, if you're Texas A&M, perfect, uh, perfect um, example of neither working. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even if you had 10 on both sides. Dean, do you have any comments about this or anything you want to weigh in? I, I you know, I kind of see you shaking your head over there. So Bob Ack unpacked a lot, but I'd be curious to see if you have anything you want to add before we jump ship. Yeah, really just that I remember when we were covering when, you know, athletic departments started endorsing collectives. I think that was, you know, just this past fall or this past winter. I want to say it was Bruce Pearl with Auburn um, did some kind of Twitter advert. And then I remember Danny White, the athletic director at um, University of Tennessee kind of talked about, Tennessee, yeah, you yeah. know, their, their collective and just how quickly this is all kind of turned into what it is in, in a matter of months. And, and it almost felt like you knew that was going to happen, right? Like you almost felt like once they were connected and once they were openly connected, I guess, you just had a feeling that, that, you know, these, these kind of phrases are going to start to get thrown around. And, um, when does it become just essentially a school paying for players? Right. And, I mean, that is essentially what it is. And and now just, you know, it, these things and it's almost a good thing that, you know, uh, issues of Title IX are being brought up because I think, you know, that that's why those things are put in in the first place is is to kind of keep this fair and even and or at least as much as it can be. And while, yes, it's fun to, you know, recruit kids on hundreds of thousands of dollars, that does kind of get away from, you know, keeping things fair and even for, for you know, the other student athletes. So do you, do you guys sometimes feel like we're in in a video game world right now where Always. it's playing with like monopoly money or something, you know, where it's <laughs> it does like- feel that way because I mean, especially with the slight state legislatures, you know, all just kind of going, you know, gang rushing in that direction, bum rushing the, the direction they're going to end up creating a situation where the federal government would probably end up having to step in to clean up after they did all of this stuff. And, uh, you know, one of the comments, which is one last comment that I read was from uh, BankerBox98. I have never seen a system less sustainable than the current NIL ecosystem. But, you know, Vanderbilt fan, you know, it is a hair above crypto, but that's damning with fa- faint praise. Although, and, and you know, on a lighter <laughs> note, you know, somebody said Kiffin would absolutely be the coach who would replace the images on play call posters with a bunch of monkeys and streetwear. Remember when those were a thing? <laughs> Boy, gosh, I too remember 2021. <laughs> the best oh, moving world my here. Goodness. Wow. We've covered a lot of ground uh today. And obviously we hate KJ couldn't be here for it, but uh certainly and appreciate Dean's um thoughts on this as he's been the star producer of this show for now several months and um kind of bringing us all the cool headlines and getting this thing in order. And then of course Bob Ack, our you our voice of Reddit slash voice of reason slash voice of policy slash Really cool yeah. hair and <laughs> mustache, and he has a really cool house. So, you know, there's a lot of cool things about Bob Ack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, but we appreciate you. And uh, with that being said, y'all, I guess I must say that this will be me signing off for the uh, final time before baby Willard um, comes along in the next few weeks. So we are expecting our first child, my husband and I. And uh, doing a doing a few weeks, so um, we're going to go on a little summer hiatus. I'm going to go on maternity leave, and we're going to let this nil thing rest for a little while. And we look forward to joining you again in the coming weeks as things start to to spring back up. I'm sure we'll have plenty to catch up on and talk about uh, in the coming months as we get fired up and ready for football season. But for now, we're going to enjoy a little summer break, a little hiatus. We hope you guys can also enjoy a little summer break and a little. R and R along the way. So have fun out there. Be safe. Enjoy your summers. And of course, follow us on NIL Now Show on Twitter and on Reddit. So of course, you can get all your updates. We'll let you know when we're back in the saddle. And until then, thank you, Bob Akhairi and the Reddit College football team. A big thank you as well to you, Dean, our producer, Dean Zolkowski, as well as my co-host Kevin Jones, who is exploring the far-off lands overseas. And then, of course, a big thank you to our audio engineer, Con Schmeling. And our executive producers, Richard Diamond, Selena Roberts, and Scott Broder. Until next time, y'all stay safe out there and enjoy. Thanks for listening to NIL Now, presented by Headline Studio and Reddit.